Tall grass aspen biome is, is unique because it's a, a small it's a small biome from, from Minnesota. Although north of uh, north of our state in Manitoba, it's a huge biome. This area here is just it's small and it's kind of an undiscovered gem. Dr. Okay. Dan Sidarsky studies Minnesota's tall grass aspen parkland biome. We are at the Red River Valley Natural History Area, which is an 85 acre area that was established uh, in 1971 to do a number of things, to uh, interpret the natural history of this region. And it's a tract of aspen parkland, which is a biological uh, uh, geographical entity that is typical of Northwest Minnesota. It's an aggregate or a composite biome that's a mixture of forest and prairie, open openness and, uh, and, and trees that is dynamic. And by, dy dyna by dynamic, I mean that the, the trees will tend to invade the, the prairie without some sort of periodic disturbance. Scarcely an explorer passed through the parkland without commenting on the islands of willow and aspen that everywhere interrupted the prairie expanse. Today, the intact areas are still a mosaic of trembling aspen and balsam poplar groves, prairies, and sedge-dominated fens dotted with willow and bog birch. A striking feature is the abundance of shrubs, more than 25 species, in the prairies and meadows, resulting in a native... Most of the area is level and poorly drained, smoothed first by glaciers and later by the waters of glacial Lake Agassiz. Their sandy soils once supported oak savanna and dry prairie, fragments of which still remain. Although the thousands of bison, prairie wolves, and elk noted by early explorers are gone, hunting opportunities abound to this day. The parkland harbors the state's second largest population of moose, and it is one of the few places in Minnesota where the sharp-tailed grouse still reaches populations of adequate size to be hunted. Not only does the parkland support a large diversity of species, but it also provides habitat for some of the state's rarest plants and animals, as documented by the Minnesota County Biological Survey in the early 1990s. Sandhill cranes were common in the Red River Valley and eastward until 1890. Settlement of the prairie and unregulated hunting dramatically decreased their numbers. By 1944, they were believed to have declined to 10 to 25 breeding pairs. Since then, the species has been increasing. By 1985, the state's population had revived to about a thousand nesting pairs. The large areas of parkland provide an unprecedented opportunity to protect sufficient acreage of a still intact ecosystem to ensure that natural processes can continue to maintain it. Conservation management at this landscape scale can help ensure adequate habitat for all parkland species, from moose to prairie voles, from the most cryptic beak rush to the showiest of orchids, the smallest yellow rail to the giant sandhill crane. Dr. Sadarsky's research focuses on managing this tall grass aspen parkland landscape with prescribed burns. What we see here is a, uh, an annual uh, burn area that is burned this, this last spring. And it top kill the aspen sucker shoots, but I emphasize top kill because they regrow again from the base. So it's something that you have to do on a regular basis. Over here on the other side of the fire break or the nature trail is an area that has not been, <coughs> been burned for three years. And, uh, and then behind that is an aspen forest that hasn't been burned at least for 40 years. So without some kind of regular, in this case burning is used as a disturbance tool, you would eventually have it uh, being all converted just to an aspen forest. And you'd lose the prairie species, both plants and animals, and, uh, and thereby a part of our uh, natural heritage in Minnesota. This landscape management is complicated by Minnesota's changing climate, and Dr. Sadarsky has already seen evidence of these impacts. Those cottonwoods grew to the size that they, that they are in 80, 90 to 100 years. So that means that the water level was, was much lower 
than it is now for 80 to 90, uh, 100 years. So we're, uh, we're, we're seeing the effects of, of rising water table, which is related, of course, to climate. Well, one of the impacts is that uh, since disturbance is such an integral part of the ecology of, uh, of this biome and, and maintaining it as a, as a composite community, if you can't burn as frequently as you would like, as it's referred to as a burning window, as that burning window becomes more compressed, or in some cases it's almost non-existent some years, you can't burn. This means that the brush element expands into the prairie even more, and so the prairie goes by the wayside and the community becomes more of a forest rather than this composite. And as it changes to more of a forest, then you lose the prairie species. When you have the composite, then you have the mixture of both, which is, I think, the best of both worlds. Yeah. Will Steger has also recognized the impacts of a changing climate on the tall grass aspen parkland biome. The tall grass uh, aspen areas, um, at least in the last decade, have been receiving a tremendous amount of rain. The amount of rain has just really it, and flooding is very typical in that area now. Uh, it always was, because it's such a low area but uh, we've seen a large increase of moisture and as a fingerprint of the climate change. I think a lot of scientists agree that, that that's what we're starting to see. 